Thank you. No, thank you very, very much. I, uh, I too have a an native, native son of this neighborhood. I grew up at 1829 Prairie Avenue near the corner of Walnut Street. Uh, I'll be 62 years old coming up soon. So I'm kind of a, uh, and I have traveled to other places as well. Uh, I was trained both in the United States and in Mexico to be a priest. And I've been here back at Our Lady of Hungary, which is my uh, home parish as a child for the last 10 years. So very invested in this neighborhood and very invested just as you are in this part of the city. And so I wanted to welcome you in a very special way to Our Lady of Hungary. Um, I, I say very proudly that we stood at this corner of, of Chapin and Calvert uh, for the last 94 years. Our school is 94 years old this year. And we're still, we still have well over 200 students in the, in the school during the academic year. And uh, they go on to do great things, uh, both in the high schools, colleges, um, in work environments, military service, uh, wherever you find young people, you're gonna find our graduates. So I just wanted to welcome everyone here uh, to Our Lady of Hungary. I wanted you to, uh, to know as well that you're in your own home here. As a phrase that I learned in Mexico, están en su casa. And so I want you to feel comfortable here as well. Uh, just a little bit of uh, background here of our parish. It was founded by Hungarian immigrants uh, back in the 1918, about 1917, 1918, uh, during a second great wave of immigration from Eastern Europe. Uh, the families predominantly settled near St. Stephen's, which is down on Thomas Street, uh, off of Chapin, uh, just to the west there. Uh, right around 1919, 1920, the community became so large that a second church was founded as a mission. Our Lady of Hungary was founded as a mission, and it was situated at the corner of Sample and Chapin, where the big intersection is today. Um, many of you might remember Hutkins Tool and Die uh, building that used to be there on that corner. That was the original corner that the mission of Our Lady of Hungary uh, was situated on. Uh, the Studebaker brothers wanted that property back to develop it, obviously, for their, their business concerns. And so that little red brick church, uh, which looked very similar to the red brick here of our school, was moved to the corner of Chapin and Calvert uh, right around the year 1920, 1921. And it was done so with animals, if you can believe that. Yeah, they moved that little church uh, with, uh, with oxen. Uh, I don't know why, but I, I've heard that from several of the old timers here in the neighborhood. Uh, since that time, that little church uh, became outgrown again. And so after World War II, the much larger church, the church that we know of today as Our Lady of Hungary, uh, was constructed. Um, about 1948, uh, groundbreaking, I think, was in late, late 1947, during the year 1948, the construction. Um, and the church was dedicated uh, Christmas of 1949. Uh, everything in the church is original to, to, the, to the church. Uh, an interesting little fact, the church was built as a bomb shelter. The basement is double deep. There's 21 inches of cement under the main floor of the church. Uh, and that's deep into the basement there. When I came back to the parish in uh, 2011, uh, there was a room designated for uh, fallout, had the old orange triangular signs on there for fallout. And I even found canned uh, army rations uh, from 1950, 1951 in the cupboards of that little room. There was a, a, a tank, I guess you'd say, a water tank about as tall as I am. And it said potable water, it was all rusted out, but it was still standing there from the 1950, 1951 era. So, uh, but the church was built as a bomb shelter, and uh, there's no way you can even drill through the floor. They said, well, we'd like to have air conditioning in the church, but uh, several contractors have told me you'd have to go all the way to Chicago or to Toledo to get drills to even penetrate that floor. So, not yet. Huh? <laughs> so, anyway, uh, once again, welcome. Uh, your, your, your ideas, your thoughts, your action are so welcome here as we continue to grow the southwest portion of the city and make it even better. Thank you again. Thank you again, Father. Uh, we also have, I think I would love to get the history of spaces, but I'm so excited about you all and the future of what's going to happen here. So we have Tim Corcoran, who's our Director of Planning, who's going to discuss the 2021 
neighborhood planning process that's happening this year. We also have Monty Anderson, who is going to tell us how, what the process is of how we move forward in redeveloping this space into our new vision. And we also have Maricela, Mike Keen here, and one more, uh, Consuela, thank you, who are our small developer local champions who are gonna share with you some of their local expertise and experience with the model that um, Monty will be sharing with us tonight. You gotta hold this. And the virtual mic is there. Gotcha, thank you very much. Thanks, Alkina. Thanks, everyone, for having um, us here today. Uh, my name is Tim Corcoran, Director of Planning for the City of South Bend. And uh, this year, we have a very ambitious um, effort of doing four neighborhood plans for the city. And these include uh, the Northeast neighborhood uh, near West Side, Kennedy Park, and not to, uh, you know, last but not least, Rum Village and an extended area around the Rum Village area. And I think that's part of the reason why um, the uh, Elkina's team helped, you know, choose this site as a, as a place for tonight's event. We want to get these ideas uh, of how neighborhoods can heal themselves and rebuild themselves and build better um, by inspiring those in this room and others around us to, to be the change that we want to see. I think that's a, that's a phrase we hear an often, often, but um, to, to be the ones that help, uh, help us help build these neighborhoods. One of the things that I've been really um, uh, focused on doing is changing any regulations that can help inspire and incentivize and take roadblocks out of small scale development uh, through changes and to the zoning ordinance. So that's been one of our, my big challenges up to date. We've got that all done. And so we're looking uh, at new things to keep kind of chipping away at all the challenges that face small scale developers in our community to give you all the incentives and all the right tools to, to move forward with your projects. Um, right now, uh, we are in a, in a process where we've done a lot of stakeholder engagement on these plans, but we're gonna be moving into more of a public process. So keep, uh, keep your ears and eyes out for that. And um, yeah, we, we hope that if, you're, if you live in the Rum Village area, you'll, you'll come and be a, a part of, of, of the neighborhood planning process. And as I was driving here today, if you're coming down uh, Kemble Street, there's a nice little two-story um, commercial, looks like there might be a, a residential unit on top, 2002 Kemble Street. It's a really good, good small-scale development project right there. So if anybody's needing a place, I saw it for sale on the way in. Uh, and uh, Mani uh, will, uh, I'm, I'm sure, inspire you to uh, outbid each other for this project. Mani, are you up next? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Howdy. Good evening. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And uh, okay. Think, yeah. Let me know if you can't hear me. If I get too quiet back there, just let me know. So uh, thank you for coming out tonight. I'm Monty Anderson, and I'm actually not from South Bend. I'm from Dallas, Texas. And what is Dallas Texan doing up here in South Bend? This has really come become like my second home because uh, many of you I've gotten to know over the years and uh, grown to know you and love you and love South Bend. And I want to tell you something about your city. You know, when you're, when you're local in your city, sometimes you really don't see the good in, you know, in the government or the politics and all of that stuff, right? I don't in my city, you know, I don't. But let me tell you something. South Bend is doing some really cutting edge stuff. And if it wasn't for your city, I wouldn't be here and wouldn't have been here the last, last few years. And maybe Mike Keene and Consuelo Hopkins and Mar Marcella, who you got to hear from, maybe they wouldn't have been as far along as they, and, 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 as they are and many others. So the city here is really committed to rebuilding these neighborhoods and rebuilding it with the locals. So a lot of cities like where I'm from in Dallas, Texas, I live in the southern half of Dallas. And then Dallas is a city of two halves. In the north, is the haves, the rich people, okay? And if you didn't go to, to SMU or Highland Park, they didn't give you the secret handshake, you know, how to get money. 
So I live in the south part of Dallas. And so out of pure desperation, a little over 30 years ago, that's where my journey as a small developer, a small incremental developer started. And so I'm the president of a company called Options Real Estate. And um, I only work and I committed my life to that area. But over the years, I became, uh, in about 2015, what we did is we decided to start an organization called Incremental Development Alliance. And the Incremental Development Alliance was designed and created to, to uh, develop a thousand small developers in cities all over the United States, like South Bend. So in other words, the big developers that are coming to town to do stuff to you, okay, what we wanted you to do is do stuff for yourself. And I call it gentrification, not gentrification. And gentrification is where the locals get the wealth. It's where the locals own the real estate. The locals do, do the work. They build the buildings. They build their neighborhood because anybody that comes usually from the outside is coming to build their financial wealth and not yours. And so incremental development is about building local wealth and uh, the real estate that goes with that. I'm also, uh, the last two years I've served as a city councilman in the little city that, that I'm from in Southern Dallas called Duncanville. And we, um, so I got to learn all about the dysfunctions of my city, you know. I mean, I learned that the city council can't meet together and talk and plan because of open meetings and walking quorums and things like this. And so, and like, we're getting here together tonight and many of you, I've, I've spent time with you or we all get together and have coffee or draw on a board or things like that. City councils can't do that. See, they have a hard time getting together. So you have to bring them things. You have to bring them your projects. You have to bring them ideas and you have to bring them sound ideas that they can get enough votes. And I think it's five here. You need five votes here to get things done. You have to do that for your, your council people. And so that makes it kind of hard uh, when, when cities, when, and that's the way cities are, are ran. So um, over the years, I've done a whole lot of different projects. E everything from uh, the theater where um, Lee Harvey Oswald was captured after he shot President Kennedy. I restored that theater and it's one of the only single screen movie theaters today that's actually for profit and it actually makes, makes a profit. I've taken mixed use buildings, small, uh, restaurants and coffee shops as little as 400 square feet, 900 square foot restaurants, loft apartments above above them. I've done a restored an old boutique mo mo motel. Um, I've done residential subdivisions. I've built little bitty houses. I've done snow cone stands. I've done street markets and community gardens. So a lot of different things. And we've won a whole lot of awards uh, with, with most of the projects that we've done. And so what I've, what I've got for you today is 12 steps to becoming your own neighborhood developer. And so just like an alcoholic, you know, we figure out our problem, okay? And so once we figure out our problem, then we can figure out the steps to our solution. And so I think that many cities have the same, the same issue. And so what I'm gonna do is take you through a, a step by step of how do you become a small developer in your community? And some of you have already done that. So step number one, and, and this is finding your farming, just like farmers. So a farmer, you know, do you guys know some farmers? Anybody know a farmer? Okay, so a farmer whose farming is filled or her field knows everything about the, about the field. They, they know, they till the soil, they know where the, the weeds are, they know where the bugs are, they know if the weather's coming in and the weather's looking like this year, it's gonna be really bad. The farmer knows everything about that farm. Well, you as a farmer for your community, so you've been up and down the streets, you know where the barbershop is, you know where the best hamburger is, you know who in the, you know who the best carpenters, you know, you know everything about, about your streets, right? Most of you do. And so what we, what we ask you to do is to commit to farming and cultivating your neighborhood for the rest of your life. And by committing the rest of your life, which is what I did in Southern Dallas County uh, over 30 years ago, to committing my life to that area, to committing it to, to to making it better for the rest of my life, it changes your life. It changes everything. And so see where I was at at the time, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be somewhere else where it was cleaner and fancier and groomed better and everything, you know. And but, but what happened is I decided to commit to this area. And from that point forward, my net worth and my life got better and better and better over the years. My mom was a telephone operator. 
one of those zero, you know, they used to plug those things in for the switchboards. My dad was a carpenter. And so I didn't start off with money. We had to start out of pure desperation. What am I going to do? I'd look around my neighborhood and I think, what is missing in my neighborhood? What's missing? Well, I got no place to get coffee. Well, if I can't, if I, and I couldn't get Starbucks to move into our, our little neighborhood, but I did get a donut shop to move to our neighborhood and serve better coffee. So I, I did the next to the best, you know, next to the best thing I could do. So, uh, so what, one, commit your life, make it forever, work that area, plant community gardens, do chairs like Mike Keene's done, the big chair, you know, help with cleanup programs, get involved in meetings like this with your zoning, just stay involved with your, with your, um, with your community. Number two, get to know your neighbors. This is people ask me all the time, how do you find tenants or people for your building? How do you find people that want to buy your building? How do you find people that might want to move into your building or, 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 or live in one of your properties? What you do is by knowing the neighborhood, you know who needs things, right? You know who in the neighborhood needs a place to live? You know who wants to open up a barbershop or a beauty shop or who's trying to open up a taco stand? You know all of those things. So by getting to know your, your, your people in your neighborhood, you're going to be able to always be able to put them into buildings. Whether you put them into buildings to lease the space or you sell the building to them. See, we can build little buildings and we can sell them to owner occupants. We can sell them to other businesses. See, with the SBA, with the Small Business Administration, if I go out here and build a little building out here that's 2,000 square feet, and I can get somebody to occupy 1,100 square feet, and then I have two apartments over the top or in the back, see, they can get an SBA loan and do that. You have a little small mixed-use building. So I can build that as a developer and sell that to somebody. So you're always cultivating uh, people for your, for, your, for your buildings. So the third thing that you got to do, and this is where people make the biggest mistakes, is you got to find the money. Have you, any of you ever bought a house lately? If you don't have your pre-qualification letter when you go in, they won't even take your, they won't even take your offer. You got to have a letter from the bank. You got to have the money. Even before you do these small commercial developments or small housing developments, you've got to have the money. You got to know the potential of where you're going to get banking. So you got to go. What I always tell people is go interview banks. So you ever gone to the bank looking for a loan? How does that feel when you go to the bank looking for a loan? Feel like you're begging for a loan, it's not fun, right? It, it doesn't feel good, it makes me nervous. But if you go to the banks, okay, up front, and you interview banks, you start interviewing them. You talk to the banker, you go in and you ask for a meeting, you go in and you start asking the bank different questions like, what kind of loan limits do you have? Do you loan on real estate deals like this? What kind of financial statements do you need from me? What kind of things do you need from me? If I wanted to build a X, can you finance that? And see, you're going to look a whole lot different. It's going to put you in the driver's seat. And so you're not going to be looking like you're, you're going in begging. You're begging for a loan. Now, you're also going to maybe from time to time want to, to get investors for your project. Where do you get investors? Do you go to Wall Street for investors? You know, where do you go for investors? Who would you go? Somebody out here that's, you know, where would you go for an investor? You know? Family and friends in your neighborhood. Do you know that the baby boomers, which I'm one, are the richest people of all time? And there's a lot of baby boomers out there that have a million or two or a couple million, three million dollars in their bank accounts. And you know what? What's happening to baby boomers right now? They're getting ready to die pretty soon. I mean, we're all going to die eventually. But you know what? You know what baby boomers want to do? They want to leave a legacy. They want, but you have to show them, and that you can you can get money from baby boomers, locals. If you get money from Wall Street investors and things like that, they're going to want all your deal. They're going to want like ninety percent of your deal. They're not going to just take a little piece of the deal. So you have you have local bankers like Notre Dame Credit Union and Resource. One is resource one you have, and then you have investors all over, uh, uh, all over the city, and they're right here amongst you. And you just have to, how do you find an investor? If you don't know where there's money, you ask your attorney, you ask your CPA, you ask your banker, do you know of any investors that might want to work with me? And they, they know all kinds of people with money. And so this is a good starting place. Banks are really the best place 
uh, to get money and the local investors are the, the site is where you go next. So fourth, number four, you have to learn legal and accounting. This business, this is another big mistake that new uh, small developers make all the time. You've got to get a good attorney. We have one here tonight who's helping, uh, helping some of our people uh, who's helping. And so if you sign a contract, you go out there and you start buying property and you're signing contracts and you're signing loan documents from a bank. Should you trust those other people you're signing those contracts with or trust the bank? I mean, you need someone that can advise you that your attorney is on your side. If you have an attorney that represents you, you're gonna look very much better with the banks and the other people, the investors that you deal with. You, know, you also gotta have a good CPA. This is a tricky business. And whether you buy it in your buy your properties in your own personal name, or you form an LLC, or you get into partners with Mike Keen or Marcella or Consuelo, you get into a partnership. You you got to have the CPA and the attorney to help you to help you with those things. And I say trust no one. So business is tricky. Okay, you trust no one. So study how to form a partnership and close a deal. It's amazing to me. I mean that people have got out here and they get in these contracts and they start to get in ownership of these deals. Mr. Attorneys, that happened a lot and they've never consulted when, and then they're in trouble. So, so a lot of people, what they do is they'll go buy a property over here and they'll put some money down and they'll have a contract and they'll start working on this property or something. They haven't closed on it. They haven't completed the transaction and come to find out there's seven heirs in this family. One of them's in prison, one of them's died. They can't transfer the title. And so you've gotten all your hopes up, you got involved in this deal and all of a sudden you can't do anything. So you gotta have an attorney and you gotta have a CPA. So number five is find a project to use as an experiment, okay? Start small, start really small. If you start small, what happens if you make a mistake is you don't lose everything. You just start small. So also what you want to do in this case is you don't want to do something that's got zoning changes when you're first starting. If you do, I mean, you want to do something you can do by right. In other words, don't try to go through, a, don't try to go do a big zoning change that takes all neighborhood meetings and, you know, going to city council and all that. Don't do that. And you got to learn how to do a pro forma. Who in here knows what a pro forma is? Anybody know what a pro forma is? So a pro forma is a business plan, basically. Pro forma, and we're going to look at one in just a second. And if you've already done some of this, which some of you have, then keep moving. What's next? You want to always keep moving. And we'll talk about the flywheel in just a minute and how that works. So let's say you go buy this, this one little property. You went and bought a little house or a building. You bought it. The first thing you need to do is clean it out. Clean everything out. Clean the building up. Even if you buy a lot, clean the lot, trim the trees clean because people in the neighborhood are going to start wondering what's going on here. So you clean it, get rid of everything. Once you clean the building out, once you clean the lot off, it's going to look a lot different and you're going to be able to plan it better. So the first thing that you do when you get a piece of property like that is clean, clean, clean it a lot. Mike Keen will show you, he'll talk about it a little bit, what he did with the Ward Bakery building. And if anybody's gone by there lately, it's very clean. And all of a sudden you can see what to do. You can see where to put doors and you can see where to put a restaurant and you can see different things. So the number seven, step number seven is to build your team. So this is a complex business and you got to have the right people. You probably got to have an architect. You may have to have an engineer. You're going to need to have some contractors and while you're cultivating your neighborhood, see while you're getting to know your neighborhood and most of you that live in your neighborhoods already, you know who these people are. You know who the architects are and the engineers and the contractors and the painters and the best plumber is, you know who they are and make sure that they know that you'll be working small scale. So you don't want to go hire a big road paving company to come do a you know a slab for a little house. You know, you want to hire the right size contract. So you want to build your team. You want to have all the right people on your team. It's very important. So now that you've got your team, you know, so how do you, how do you plan the most effective way? And this is, this is something that took me a long time to learn. I used to get an architect. Some of you may have done this. I had them do all these drawings and stuff. They'd get the drawings done. Then I'd take the drawings and bid them. 
and then they'd come in twice what I had to spend, what I have you know, over the budget. They're way over the budget. So I found that if I get an architect and I'll get the carpenters and the, the steel workers and the plumbers and the air conditioning people all to come in together and that we actually sit down at the table together and we start sketching and deciding what we're going to do, you can save a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of headaches because you could spend twenty or thirty thousand dollars on architectural plans many times and still be you know and and it just be wasted because you you, you got to have this team so so you're no longer alone so if you feel overwhelmed in this business you've got all these people backing you up so you're going to look smart if you have the right people around you. you have your attorney you have your cpa you have a good architect you have good engineers you got a really trusty carpenter you got to have a good carpenter and just to show you how this works, one day I was building, a, I was building this, this one building and the steel worker was out there and it was a two-story building and I'm walking around the building and the steel worker said to me, this is a guy, the steel workers, they think they're kind of tough guys anyway, usually steel workers do. And so he's standing around out there and he said, I, I came by and he goes, yeah, the people, it's my building. He said, the people that own this building are a bunch of dumb A's. I won't say it, I won't cut. Bunch of dumb, you know. And I, I said, oh, yeah, tell me more. <laughs> he said, yeah, if they would have just done this and this and this, I could have saved them $100,000. I said, hold it right there. I went and got my engineer and architect and came back. And sure enough, his idea saved us not $100,000, but about $75,000 on this building. Saved us that. The guy with, you know, with the welding rig out there. So, you know, these are the people that do this work. And I like to take them through my buildings when I'm first working, planning them. And I have the architect following us, the carpenter, and we're saying, move this, change this, do this. And everybody's on the same page and you're talking, it's a very effective way uh, to plan and get this work done. So the next thing you do is number nine is you set up a construction management system. Okay, and this, do you need to hire a general contractor or are you just doing a bathroom remodel? Can you do that yourself? You know, what do you do? You know. And so some of us in this, this business, we have to become our own general contractors. This, this kind of business will not allow us to hire a general contractor. We have to become our own. In some cases, you may have to hire a general contractor. So you got to decide what you're going to do there. So it's number 10, step 10. It's time to move. If you have a tenant, so if you're, you're let's say you're, you're rebuilding a house or a real building and you have a tenant, you're ready to move them in. You're ready to get moving in. Let's say you don't have one and you got this building, move yourself in, be a tenant to yourself. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've moved my office into the new developments that I was in. I, I became the tenant and then other people wanted to be around where I was at. So I became the tenant myself. I became the tenant in my own house. So, uh, so you can put your office there, you can put your workout studio there, you can put your bakery that you can put whatever you, you know you put put all of those things in your own in your own place number 11 learn to manage your property and it's okay if you're not the best at doing everything so you hire people when i when i first started i had two people i had a bookkeeper helping me manage and a maintenance person part-time both of them are helping me and that's that's all i have that was my management people and over the years now i've got a cfo i've got bookkeepers property managers leasing agents and that can build incrementally over time. It can build. And then number 12, you help others. And this is the real, the real part about incremental development that we do. We, we committed a long time to help, help create a thousand small developers in other cities. And so we share this information. When we leave today, Mike and Marcella and Consuelo have information that they share, that they're going to share with you. And so we share with each other. So how do you get started in, um, in this business um, if, you've, if you've got nothing? Let's say that you said to me, Monty, I'm ready to start doing this in my neighborhood. And let's say that, let's say you have no skills. I'm gonna assume, assume that somebody's got no skills. And they I said, well, what have you been doing? I've been cleaning parking lots. Okay, cleaning parking lots is a valuable thing. <laughs> If you own properties, keeping your parking lot is clean. And I have, this is a real story. And I have a guy who was a, who was a parking lot cleaner. And I talked to him about this and he started, he was traveling all over the place. And I said, pick you a farm to clean parking lots. Okay, pick you a farm. He picked the area around his home. 
He started cleaning parking lots for all these people that own buildings. And he cleaned parking lots and he started cranking what we call the flywheel. See, this is a flywheel. You know what a flywheel is? We're old enough here, most of us, that flywheels on the car and as you get it going, it goes faster and faster and faster. And so he cleaned parking lots all over the place and he cleaned parking lots for building owners. Well, what happened? A building owner came to him and said, I want to sell my building. Do you know anybody who wants to buy it? And he bought the building and he became a small developer as a parking lot cleaner. So over time, he had more buildings and more buildings and he still kept cleaning parking lots. I started off as a, as a realtor leasing spaces, leasing commercial spaces. I would run around and lease spaces for other people and get money and sell and broker buildings. I started doing that. And then beginning, I didn't own anything and I leased all for other people. And today I lease now I'm like 85% for myself. So if you're an architect, you can get into the flywheel. A local architect can start to, to represent all the, like a lot of the people in their neighborhood. Uh, uh, an attorney can get into the flywheel. A property manager can get into the flywheel. A carpenter can get into the, to the flywheel. One of the things that I dream about a lot is that one day I'll pull up on a construction site and I'll say, where is the developer? And somebody will say to me, there he is up in the rafters with his tool belt on. So why shouldn't the carpenter or the plumber or the painter get to do the development and make the money there? So you want to get into the flywheel. So what I do here in my business is I do leasing and manage property management and construction. And so I make money off my own proper projects doing that. So we're going to look at a little bit of a financial analysis quickly and get to them. But this is the essentials. This is how buildings make money. Um, so you want to seek, you know, professional advice all the time, but we're going to learn here about construction and development cost, sales and rental prices across different units. We're going to uh, learn how to market expectations on the units at the, pri in, at the price points. So here's the inputs you need. You need the project size. All you got to know is the size of a house or a building. That's all you got to know. And then you got to know what the hard and soft costs are. What does it cost? To, what do we think it's going to cost to remodel this or to build this? And then what are the soft costs? What do we got to have for architect, engineers, th that kind of thing? How many units are there? How many units are there? And what kind of financing what might we get here? Remember, we've already gone to the bank. So we already interviewed the bank and know what the financing is. So the outputs we get are the total cost, the effective income, the projected cash flow and what the investment returns look like. So this is the basic pro forma and what, what you get what you get here. So a building for rent is that rent collections, total rent income, and then operating expenses, taxes and insurance and common area maintenance. People, people make mistakes on this all the time. They don't get the right things. The debt service, that's your loan debt payments. And that equals when you when you take the rent minus the operating expenses minus the debt that gives you the annual cash flow. What you can what you have in your pocket at the end of the, end of the day. If you're building buildings for sale, so you, you figure out what you can sell something for, what are the commissions, what was your loan amount, and then that's what your cash flow is. So in this business, say so you can build and lease or you can build and sell because in the beginning, I didn't have enough money to build and hold and lease. I had to use my credit. So I had to build and sell and build and sell and build up like night. We're not house flippers. Okay. We're, we're really town, we're town builders because we're more interested in more than just interested in the money. We're interested in our community being built. So the rental pro forma is here's just the, the, the terms potential income. That's the potential it has. That's the highest potential and the vacancy and non-payment will give us an adjusted gross income. The operating expenses equals the net operating income. This number right here, this net operating income, that's how buildings are valued. See, it's building, and this doesn't count against you. Like if you go buy a house, okay, they look at your personal income, okay, to see if you can afford the house. In a building, they look at how much money the building will make, and that's how they do this. And minus the debt service equals the cash flow. So this is a little example of a building. See, this was an old post office. So you've, you've got buildings like this, right? This is 2,500 square foot building. And um, so the payments on this building um, or the, the income on this building is, I was looking at it two ways. One, just to, to refurbish it like, it like it is. And one is I'd put two units on the top. That's option number one and option number two. 
And so you see the top two lines equal the third line, which is equals the gross income of the building minus the vacancy, minus the taxes and the operating expenses. And you see at the bottom, the net operating income of 22,000. If I don't put the apartments on top and 38,000, if I put the, if I put the apartments on top. So the project, we project, now we project the, the cost. Option number one, if I don't put them on, I have to invest, I'm investing $200,000. If I put the apartments on, I'm investing $430,000. So see, I may want to put apartments on top of a building, but I may not be able to afford to do that. So I may not be, I may not be at that point yet. And then the projected soft costs, these are the soft costs again are architect's fees and interim and interest while you're building it and taxes and mowing and cleaning. And so on one side is 48,000 and one side's 90,000. And then you've got um, uh, soft cost. And then you've got your, um, your, um, your total cost. And then the cost per unit. So one of them is a $600,000 deal and one of them is a $325,000 deal. So the down payment on option number one with no units is 81,000. Option number two is 150,000 and the loan amount. So where am I going to get $81,000 build a building like this or much less 150,000. So remember back at the beginning, we talk about the baby boomers. So if you had three baby boomers that give you 25,000 a piece, or you've got three people that'll give you, you can break it down and we, we, that's what we, we show you how to do. And so then you have your monthly debt service on one, uh, which is 1350 and 2400 on the other one. And then your, the, your annual debt service, and it gives you your cash flow. You can see there at the bottom, you have cash flow of 5,500 or 8,000. So then you can start to decide what you're gonna do. So what you can afford to do. So these are the, these are kind of, this looks complicated when you look at it for the first time, but it's actually uh, very simple. So then you look at your cash on cash return. A lot of times when we're, when we're building in our own communities in the very beginning, it's not very good. It's, it's not the, the prices are low and you can see this not a very high cash return, 7% or 5%. But over time, if you work in your neighborhood and that flywheel, these will get bigger and they will get bigger and they will get bigger over time. So this is what we did here. So we put two apartments on top of this building. Said so it took no new roads, no new sewer, no new infrastructure. And the city got, you know, a $600,000 building on a little bitty lot. And so everybody come out the winner on this. So again, back to the, the project inputs. If you know these few things, project size, the hard and soft cost, the unit scenario and the financing, then you can get these other things. You'll get the total cost, the effective income, the projected cash flow, and how it works as an investment. And so um, with that, uh, Mike Keene is going to come up now and talk about his projects here uh, in South Bend. Mike Keene is a guy that has followed these steps. And then after Mike, Consuelo is going to come up and then Marcella, and then we're going to have questions and answers or, or discussions after that. Here you go. technical break here. That's great. All right, we're good. Let's move. Let's not put the table forward. forward. Okay, thank you all. Um, and uh, what I want to do is is just share with you a little bit of my own experience um, in in getting involved uh, in doing um, some of, of this uh, small scale development. Uh, and so what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about my story, how I got into doing this, um, and then some of the steps. Uh, 
that were along the way. Uh, but uh, about five years ago now, uh, I was a college professor. Uh, and I was teaching sustainability studies and sociology at Indiana University of South Bend. Um, and I was ready to start and look to go do something. And I thought that I was going to become a consultant. And I thought I was going to a sustainability consultant. And I thought I was going to help uh, a guy by the name of Dwayne Borkholder build one house that produces as much energy as it uses. Because while I was running that sustainability program at IU South Bend, trying to figure out a way to make our world more economically sound, ecologically friendly, and socially inclusive um, and responsible altogether, what we call the triple bottom line, I met Dwayne, who was trying to do something similar. Uh, but the problem was, is that he had a whole new way of building houses, and his way of building houses um, is kind of uh, what, uh, uh, you know, the first person started looking at like one of these 15 years ago. And that was, what in the heck is that, and why would you ever use it? Uh, and so uh, what I said to Dwayne is, I tell you what, Dwayne, um, why don't we just build one of these in my neighborhood, and if you can't sell it, uh, then I will buy it. Uh, and I will rent it out because I can make enough return on investment to cover my expenses. Um, and I knew that that was what would have to happen because the fact of the matter is, is I'm in a near Northwest neighborhood and, uh, you know, five years ago, it would have cost me $150,000, $160,000 to build that house. Uh, it would cost me two hundred twenty dollars today, uh, but I would have been able to sell for $135,000. So I would be in what we call an appraisal gap. Uh, and then uh, we were talking about doing this, uh, and we talked to uh, Kathy Schuth at the local cup, which is a community coffee shop that we have on weekends over there in our neighborhood, my farm. Uh, and Kathy said, hey, Mike, we've got three lots. How would you like to build on three lots and not just one? And I said, sure, you know, we'll build on one, but now I've got three houses I'm going to build that are not going to be able to pay for what they cost. Uh, so, okay, we're going to think about that. Uh, and then what we found out after that was Habitat for Humanity, they owned another four lots. This was a triangle uh, in, our, in our neighborhood that had had 13 houses on it, but now it had seven. Uh, and there were six empty lots there. And so we go to talk with Habitat for Humanity. You know what Habitat says? Hey, Mike, would you like us to sell you our lots? I'm going, no, <laughs> I already got three, I don't know. But what we say is, we'll do this. Uh, my partner, Dwayne, says, we'll teach you how to use our same building system so that your habitat families can have the same high performance net zero houses as our market rate families. And by the way, Dwayne gave him a $25,000 discount on each of those packages. And we actually got habitat to build our first five houses um, in the neighborhood. But here was a problem. Right around the corner from all of this, was this building here, the old Freppin's Flower Shop. My stepson used to get his boutonnieres at that place. And it was being used basically as a flop house, probably they were uh, uh, making drugs and junk all over the place. Well, how am I gonna get anybody to rent or buy a brand new house, no matter how high performance, if that's sitting around the corner? So we made a deal to purchase that and renovate it. And that actually became my first project. Um, and I spent a lot of time in that project. The fact of the matter is, I probably spent more time uh, painting and cleaning out and doing caulking because the drywall guy did a lousy job. But that's what small development is about when you start. Man, you're the one that starts doing everything. Because, you know, it takes a while to build a team like Monty's got, uh, or even, you know, a team like Consuela. Consuela's got a good support team too. Well, the problem was right next door to that was this. Well, how can I fix up that and not fix up this? Well. You know, so then we picked that up. And then the tax sale started. And you know what our city looks like, right? We knocked all these lots down in all these places. That's what our neighborhood, you know, I see all those are red, are, are, are lots that uh, uh, are, uh, my, my farm right now is right here. And by the way, I hope you see that. But this area used to look like up in here. Uh, but we started picking up tax lots. So before I had been six months out of the university, thinking I was going to become a sustainability consultant, I owned seven vacant lots and I owned a, a building and I had a commitment to build uh, three new houses. And I didn't know how to do a performer. I'd never heard the term of pro forma. And so fortunately, uh, somebody told me about this group called Inc. Dev, Inc. Mail Development. And I went up and I met, met, met Monty and his team up in Flint. And I was so impressed by what they were doing. 
that I not only wanted to learn from them, I wanted to bring them here to South Bend because I felt that they had developed a way to help us rebuild our neighborhoods, not only in South Bend, but in cities across the country. And that's why we've been working with them uh, is because we think, I think there's a way of doing this that we can all get involved in. And you do not have to be an expert. Believe me, I was not an expert by any means. You just have to have some hustle and you gotta be willing to have a sense of humor and just work hard day after day. And you know what, sometimes what that means is that that means just going out there like I did uh, last week, 18,000 steps to sweep the floors of my current building. Or the week before that, I lost four or five pounds digging dirt off the sidewalks and edging the sidewalks. Why? Because clean, clean, clean is what makes things look like. So, so I really believe in this mission. And, you know, they're trying to create a thousand developers, small scale developers around, around the country. We're trying to create 20 here in South Bend. I bet we already got 12. And probably five or six of them are sitting right here in the room. And we want a couple more of you to join us. And how do you do this? It is, as Monty says, it's one step at a time. And the fact of the matter is, we want you to dream big and dream bold, but then you've got to get down to work. If all you do is dream big and dream bold and you never start, you'll never make the next step, right? You don't get to the top of the step by saying, I wanna be up at the top of the step and how many to get there. You, want, you know, I've gotta to get to step one and I gotta to get to step two. And this is the same way. Each step you take, you learn a little bit more. So what we're always encouraging people to do is get started. Find a project that you can do because you will learn. And as you do that project, more projects will come along. Like I said, I started out to help build one house. Well, that was five years ago. Now uh, I've become an academic developer. And this is my farm. This is the near north right here. I live right here. I lived here for 25 years. I'm going to live here for the rest of my life. And this is where I'm going to work, right here. And that's how I know my neighborhood. And so what do we do with this? We change that into that. So now you go down forward and you see that building. And I've got, uh, I've got three, four tenants down below, each paying 250 bucks a month, and one tenant up above, basically 1925. A, a 925. Yeah, I wish I could get, oh my God, hey, if I could get 1925, I'd be going, whoa, I'd get 1925 for the whole freaking building. <laughs> that's what it's with this, next door. But actually, what the lift place, we've got uh, a couple of people in there, we're getting the, we're, we're getting 1350 out of that. Uh, and then, of course, we had the, the Habitat folks did theirs. And then we've got this, what we call the, the elephant in the farm. This is the old war bakery building. And that has been sitting there forever, a neighborhood nuisance, bringing the entire neighborhood down. It ought to be a crime. People like that ought to be, you know, they should have their wealth taken away or they should be thrown in jail. They've done it across the country to every one of our neighbors. They walk away from these properties and it hits every one of us. And yet we let them do it. The NNN tried to put affordable housing with tax credits in that building six years in a row. The last year, they had to come to me to get that because I had bought two vacant lots and for a parking lot. And you know what I said to him? I said, I will give you an MOU and I will sell you this parking lot for a buck a piece just because. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for participating in our incremental development seminar today. My name is Maricela Concepcion Navarro, and I am going to share um, a story about the property 630 West, including with my family. So how many of you are parents here tonight? A couple, a lot of you. How many of you have children? Teenagers, babies, school-age children. Well, that's that's me. I have four children, from a baby to an incoming freshman in high school this year. You guys know how hard it is to be a parent, and it is more than a full-time job. Um, it is also hard, especially if they're in travel sports like my children. 
I am also a wife. I'm a daughter. I love taking care of my family, my siblings, my cousins. Um, I'm an aunt um, and I'm a cousin. Um, I love, I really enjoy being there for my family and I always try to show them that I care. I also have a full-time job with the South Bend School Corporation that requires me to travel throughout the week across 22 Northern Indiana um, counties. I work with migrant families across Northern Indiana. So as you can see, I am pretty busy. And on top of that, I am also on the board for the Indiana Health Center on Western. And I currently join the Latin American Chamber of Commerce board. I also um, am part of the South and Fort Wayne Diocese and we attend a different church in Spanish and in English, almost a different one every week. Um, I'm also part of the Vincentians group where we deliver food for St. Vincent de Paul to families in need in our community. And one of the other big things I do is I have a trucking company with my brother and my father. So they work under my authority and I manage to find time to do all of this. And my most new project is 630 West. So this is the 630 West building. It is a mixed fuse apartment building. Um, I created Navarro Properties along with my family in March of 2021. I, made, I created it along with my father, Jorge, my mother, Maricela, my brother, Victor, and myself. My parents acquired the mixed fuse apartment building in 2006. The original purpose was to create a cheese factory in this building while renting the two apartments in the back. But of course, God has his own plan for us and that never worked out. And I am glad it didn't work out because in 2009, no, 2010, my parents were on a land contract and they spent over $30,000 in two years on this land contract for a house that was never theirs. And they lost the house. so. I understand how some people feel about land contracts, especially in our neighborhoods. So we ended up moving here to 630 West. And instead of having it as the two apartments, we just created a single residential building that we used to live in. And this has been our home ever since. At one point, I believe there was 12 of us there because my parents always welcome anyone who needs a home. And um, I'm thankful that they have showed me to care for others. So currently the plan of 630 West is to create this building back into a mixed use apartment building with four office spaces slash, slash a retail space. This is the first floor that you are looking at. And it will have um, two small offices, one medium and one large retail space. And then a bathroom and a kitchenette to be used by all of the spaces. In the apartment, the apartment space, the first floor will have two bedrooms and two full bathrooms. And this in total is approximately 3,200 square feet between all of the floors. In the lower level, you can see where the first floor will have that bedroom studio. Um, the layout has kind of changed as I've continued to talk to more contractors and it seems a little bit harder now to do the studio we were hoping for in the basement. Um, on, the, on your left side, you can see four storage units, which we plan to include um, for rent that can be part of the retail space in the first floor. In the second floor, we will have two bedrooms and one bathroom. And talking about the income and the cost. Currently, the monthly rent in total, if all of the spaces get leased, it's approximately 3,900. 
um, the hard cost of fixing this building, we're calculating 250,000, but in total, the development cost is closer to 360,000, since that includes using the building as equity for a 25% down payment. Our debt service to coverage ratio is 1.28, and our cash on cash return is 6.4. The challenges. So in our current situation, there has been many, many challenges, and it hasn't gone as smoothly as I had hoped it would be. Um, currently, everyone in the construction business is extremely busy to call you back or make time for you. Getting estimates has been the hardest thing for me. Um, I thought it would just be, oh, a month or two, and then we can get things going. And unfortunately, that has not been the case. The prices of materials has also gone up a lot, which worries me because if I can't get those estimates locked in, I'm afraid those, the cost of materials will just keep rising. So you have to know exactly what you want before you start talking to anyone in construction because it's, everyone has a different opinion of how things should be done even though some of their ideas are really good and some you're like, that is nothing to do with what I want. What I have learned is always, always stick to what you want and what you think is best for yourself. So why did I create Navarro Properties on top of everything? Back in 2018, I came across a Facebook post um, for Spark which is part of the Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative at St. Mary's. When I went to the information session, I met with the director Willow, and I had mentioned that I was interested in doing something with housing in our community. We had a brief chat, and then I went on. Um, I was able to complete Spark in the fall of 2018, no, in the winter of 2018, and that is where I created uh, the trucking business. For a lot of people that know me, they know that I was never interested in anything to do with business or having my own business. So this was a huge surprise for my family and for everyone else who knew me. So then in July of 2020, I received a call and an information um, session from Willow about incremental development, if and, not, and they asked me if I wanted to be a part of it. I had just had my son in February, and he was only four months old. I was like, this is a lot on top of everything that I'm already doing. I don't think it's going to be feasible for me to do anything with it. Um, so then I get another call from Jim. And he says, everything will be virtual. We will be with you 100% of the time. We're going to take this step by step. He's like, I really think you would be great at this. And after much consideration, I was like, you know what? Let me just try it and see what happens. Um, I, you learn from every experience. So I did it. I finished in the incremental development. I was part of the first cohort. And in January of this year, we presented. And it was, I was very excited. And my next step is now getting the estimates and going into, going to talk to a bank. What I learned from incremental development was that you have to care about your neighborhood so that you can farm it. If you are not interested in making the city a better place, then these 12 steps will not work for you. And what I found out is that I was very tired of seeing the neighborhoods get destroyed. Um, I grew up on the south side of town. So I was behind Studebaker, um, Riley High School in that area. And for college, I went to IUSB. And this is where I lived on the Rim Village side of town. And it's just very sad to see that many of the kids will not grow up 
knowing the kids in the neighborhood because they do not go to the same school. It is sad to see that it is scary to walk your neighborhood. It is scary to send kids on the bus because the neighborhoods are sometimes really bad. It is sad to see and hear all the shootings that go on at night and the siren, sirens going off every night. So I wanted to do this because I care about South Bend. I want to make it a safe place again. And I want our neighborhoods to be walkable again. Um, I want us to be able to enjoy the city and the future that our kids can have by, by staying here. So this is why I decided to become an invested community member and create Navarro Properties. And that is all. Thank you. example here of of the of, of a building you've seen these buildings all around right that Consuelo has and even in Mike Mike too but you can see that you say well how do you rent these buildings that nobody wants how, why would anybody want to rent these buildings so I believe in South Bend there's lots of small entrepreneurs around I believe there's a lot of them a lot of them that we don't even know yet. people that don't have an entry point that can get in at five hundred dollars or two hundred and fifty dollars you see, she created this retail space for these offices. See, here's one that's just 110 square feet. So this is probably got to be around $300, $300 a month. And, and another one is the same way. So she's got to, again, by taking these buildings and, and reusing them and changing them, the shapes of the insides, they're making them viable, financially viable, and rentable to the neighborhoods. And, and besides that, office space is changing because of Zoom and COVID. And retail is all changing, right? Because of Amazon and Walmart and, and, and COVID's changed office buildings and housing's changing because of the way we live. We're living more together and how we can divide. So you can take properties and divide them up differently and reuse them. Even a house today, you think about it back in 1970, uh, a family looked like this. It was mother, mother and father and 2.6 kids, I think, something like that. You know, today... And 70% and, and of the people were like, like that. By the year 2030, unfortunately, only about 20% of the people be living like that. So people have bigger houses, so the houses can be cut up, maybe, and, and the buildings can be cut up and repurposed and reused. And if you notice something about all three of them, about all three of these, these people here, and there's others here uh, too, <laughs> but they care, care about your community. It's not about just flipping houses. But we need to make money, and sometimes we have to sell things. But it's more about it's caring about your community and making money. So I call it conscious capitalism, if you will. But it's, but it's uh, Mike calls it. What do you call it? Market sensitive socialism. Market sensitive socialism. <laughs> so, so he and I come from the right and left. <laughs> we're, we're really similar. You know, we're very really similar, but coming from two different places, but. You can see how you can reuse these buildings. And so we're we're gonna we're here to answer any questions or if anybody's got any thoughts or comments about your neighborhood. I know we've got a contractor here, we have an attorney here, and then there's Anne from Sibley who's also gone through and uh, doing her own project. Uh, it's Sibley. And uh, so we've got you know, there's other people. You can get into this business being any being any different way. You can be, you know, you can be in transportation, you can be a professor. You can be an attorney, you can be, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to get a contractor is a really good way to be in this <laughs> business because that's the, one of the hardest things to do right now. A leasing agent is also a good way to get into this business. So I'm about to that. <laughs> Anybody, any questions? Yeah, I don't give any yeah. Do we have any questions on Zoom? For either Consuela or Mike, I invite you guys to join me. So in case anyone has any questions. <laughs> How do we get those? Your is not done yet. Correct. I'm still in the estimate phase. So I do need to speak to contractors. And so I will be looking for you after this. <laughs> Like, uh, what, like what, what 
the transition? Like, do you see your property taxes went up like big time from the time you started? No, not yet. Do you so want to wear this? Oh. Oh. No, not yet. I have not seen the property taxes go up, but it is something, you know, we, um, we know maybe coming. You know, so that's, that's part of the strategy, too, um, of putting all this together. So tax two has to go up some, but you, hopefully people have more wealth. You know, you'll build, this will build more wealth for families, and then mm -hmm. you can pay more taxes so the city can fix sidewalks and streets. Yeah. Because these vacant lots don't create a lot of tax. You know, so they, it's hard to fix the streets and the sidewalks when you have mm -hmm. low, like Mike showed on his tax. Yeah, you saw that wrap up on Mike's taxes, mm -hmm. and that's really not like anybody's taxes going up. That's just like there's people on the on, on yeah, land that, that work there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I believe it's also so for me strategizing. You know, being a numbers girl, I knew that I had to be strategic and making sure that we're able to um, bring in and increase our revenues. Um, I crash flow as quickly as we could, put things aside. So when that happened, we weren't surprised, right? Or, or that it takes a, so much of a bulk of our, um, of our income, right? And then also though too, and then strategically, that's why you have that plan, you buy and hope for us being able to then turn around and sell them to our tenants. Well, now they have the homestead credit on it. So then, you know, that helps as well. So there's a lot of good things that can go into it to be strategic, to make sure that you're um, holding on, you know, to your own wealth as well. It's not only giving it to the city. Okay. She got in, Consuelo was in the farm doing taxes already. So she's in that flywheel doing her, doing her, mm -hmm. doing her deal yeah. and, her, and her house is good at the same time. So it became a really natural thing for her to, to do because she can help people plan and finance. I got you. Yes. Everyone needs a great tax accountant, right? Everyone does. And and it just helps to know, you know, real estate as well, too. So, yep. yeah, you gotta, helping you anyway. Gotta have, you know, you just got, for people out there, you just got to have a good attorney. Bruce, Bruce is right. You got to have an attorney that knows about real estate, not a, not a, a divorce attorney mm -mm. or a criminal attorney, you know, or a patent attorney. You need a business attorney. One that knows real estate, how to form LLCs, you know, what and how to form that. Go ahead. So you are the a difference. So you calculated on a, an A cap and see so we were looking at a 10. So that's good. Right now you can find cap rates in six We use the higher the cap rate, the lower the price. We use mm -hmm. the 10 cap a conservative. Yes. Very conservative. Mm -hmm. He's right. He's a local Nice. 
But you, I want to give you a little insight into Capra. It's magic with numbers. Okay, Capra is a derivative of market interest rates, expected yields on, on the investment. A bunch of things come under Capra. The best way to determine what a Capra rate is is to look at existing sales of commercial buildings because the net operating income divided by the value of sales is the Capra. Mm -hmm. So that's why we use. Yeah, look, you can. A cap rate is the is what the appraisers use to evaluate these, these properties. And it's as if you pay cash for a property. If I said, I'll pay, I, I want to find me a property that I can get a 10% return on. Find me a property. And she has a property that says 55000 I can pay 555000 Yes. So if I paid all cash, so it's looked at as if you paid all cash. It's a market condition. As interest rates go up, the cap rate will go up too. So if interest mm -hmm. rates go up, you know, so it meaning the, if interest rates go up, the property values go down. Mm -hmm. so the cap rate goes up. So there's several conditions, like Bruce was saying, that cause things to happen. Right now we're in a crazy, weird time with inflation going like crazy. Capital gains is being talked about and going up. And you know, going up 30% or something like that are great. So there's all kinds of weird conditions going on right now. It just takes studying and getting used to it. Uh, over a while, usually a six cap, which is would give her a really high price, is something like where you bought a CBS on the corner up here. Or you bought something with a national credit tenant, it would be a lower cap rate because you could pay more with less risk. With little tenants of uh, small entrepreneurs, you'd have maybe a higher cap rate because they're more risky. They're, they're more risky. And the appraiser is going to look at several conditions and, and, this, and, the, and determine that cap rate. It's kind of, right now we spend, I would say, generally across the country, about eight, eight and a half cap rate. Is probably, if I had to say there's a cap rate across the country, I'd say eight. Probably eight and a half. Generally, generally. Nice. Is it It, de it depends. It could. It could. It depends on how cheap money is. You know, like if money gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, cap rates are going to go down. If you can pay more. So right now, if you buy like a $275,000 house right now, you know, your payments are only like $1,100 a month or something like that. Yeah, so money's nearly free. So if money goes down to two or three percent, the cap rate's li likely to go down with that. Likely to, likely to. I'm not saying for sure because there's, there's, there's lots of different conditions that, that cause that to do. To do so we have, we have a Good question. question online. Mm -hmm. um, this session has been on small scale developing. What about small scale investing? Are there plans in South Bend to help match those boomers, et cetera, with people with ideas? Some of us may want to be small scale investors in our town, but not be the developer. Mike, you were literally just yeah. talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking about that yesterday. What we want to try to do is identify exactly that a group of folks who would be interested in doing some of that kind of investment uh, so that we can match those folks up because uh, money is almost free, but you only can get it if you don't need it. Uh, and Good so point. Good point. Part of the reason for that is that the standard ways you get money is through get through banks, uh, particularly traditional banks. They have certain kinds of requirements about collateral. If your bank, if your building is not in very good shape, then there's not much collateral. So then they want free leasing. So if you don't have a building that looks pretty good, uh, you don't get the free leasing. So now, how do I get the money to get the free lease? Okay. So one other way to get some money is to buy to match some investors. What we're trying to find we're trying to find some local investors, again, who care about their community because if it's just somebody who's coming in who wants the whole deal and they basically want to put in some money and just take away half the deal, that's not helping folks. So we need some folks who are willing to go for that five, six, seven percent patient capital rate where they're going to get better than they've got at the bank account. But you know, they're going to mm -hmm. let the people who put the time and effort in get some return uh, as, as well. And the way I see it, because I have, I have, I've, I've had money that I can invest. Um, I've got some of my money invested in the stock market. I got some of my money invested in my own real estate. I've got some money invested in 
projects where it's much less return. But I see that's part of my form of philanthropy, right? I'm not giving the money away. I'm loaning it at lower terms. Uh, and that way, when that money is paid back, I can loan it out again. So there's a whole variety of ways of thinking that. But we really want to try to put that together. So if you, Absolutely. If you get that person's name, if you, you, you see the performance, you see the performance on everybody here. What you want to do is we want to build a package on a project. We want to be able to present it to the bank or to an investor to show that we're professionals. We have an LLC set up, we have a CPA set up, we have a good contractor, we have all these people around us that that, that are part of that team. Because you're going to be attractive, see, to capital. See, if you prepare yourself, capital will come to you. It'll, it'll be attractive. And then you can go to the bank. Like, listen, listen to this. This is the secret here. Okay. You go to the banker and you say, hey, Mr. Banker, Miss, Mrs. Banker, do you know anybody that's got a lot of money? And he's got a computer. She's got a computer right there, right? He's got everybody's bank accounts. So, yeah, I know some people. But he's not going to tell you, right? Mm -hmm. But what he could say is, do you know anybody that might want to invest in the, in the neighborhood? What's the neighborhood? Rum, Rum, Village. Rum Village. Do you know anybody that might want to invest in Rum Village with somebody an up and coming or a small developer? And the bank would go, you know, I know a person that's perfect for that. So you can also ask your attorney. I mean, this attorney right here, I guarantee you, he knows people that have wealth that live here. A CPA knows people that have wealth. And they can they they can't tell you secrets of their clients, but they could if they like you, is introduce you to somebody. And and the baby boomers right now they want to leave a legacy. Sometimes baby boomers that are holding on to their money too tight need to be you know they need to you need to you got to shame them into doing it. You, know, you got to shame them into doing it. But if you do it properly and you do it in small enough doses, like if you need one hundred fifty thousand, you divide it up into three fifty thousand. That's not going to probably break it, somebody, you know. Then you can you can make you can kind of break it down. One hundred fifty thousand sounds a lot, you know. Fifty thousand sounds less. Fifty thousand still high. Don't get me wrong, you know. Fifty thousand still a lot of money, but you're able to break it down and maybe have two or three people in your LLC prepared by your your um, attorney. capable attorney can can make those make that deal right. And make it now. And the good thing about an LLC document is just about you can make up about anything you want to. You can make it say, it can say you pay you 2%, it can say you'll get paid back in 10 years, or, I mean, it can be, you know, LLCs can be, they're, they're very flexible documents to uh, write your, what your deal is with each other. That's right. why it's important to make good lawyers. They're very flexible, so you want to make sure it's well. And you got to have a lawyer that money up front when you're out making offers. If you already own a building, it's different, like, you know, they own buildings, but because when you're making offers, you got to have that attorney ready to go for you. Jump in. You got to have the money banker that's going to write you a letter saying she can get a loan. She can get a loan. That's why we put it in the steps. You have to have that stuff. You have those things up front. You're ready to go. If you get ready, you'll get lucky. Things will come to you. If you don't get ready, if you don't have a lot of money that you're paying rent, you can afford to pay rent. And one of the things to begin to think about is. One way to start is get yourself a house that needs to fix up, move into it, pay yourself rent, fix it up. That's one way people get started who don't have. You know, each, that way our family mm -hmm. will have your funds and help you say, hey, mom and dad, or hey, Bob, my brother or sister, you know, can you help me get into this house? I'm going to live here and you can show them the performer. I'm going to pay rent to myself rather than to, you know, this apartment complex here, and I'm going to fix this up. And then you get that first one, then you're starting that, that flywheel one. Then you can move on to the second one. Now, if you happen to, you know, have a successful career what I did, you know, and saved all my life, well, then 30 years later, I was in the position, but, you know, if I would have started this 30 years ago, uh, instead of going into the professoriate, I would have started by moving into a house, fixing it up, and worked that way. Just depends well, on where you're at. Little back here, her own tenant, and her own law, fixing to be three units, two, three units. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's right, you just move into your own. Uh, from your experience, is that better to take money from investors or take money from banks? Probably, in my opinion, it's better with the banks. Because the banks are going to pay them off and their interest is low, and then they're gone. But an investor can also loan you money. And you could put your interest up as collateral. Just so, let's say that you guys, you know, you're going to loan me money. 
And I said, I'm going to like, well, what you're going to ask me, what's the collateral? Well, I'm going to give you my, my interest in my LLC as my collateral. If I don't pay you back, you'll take my interest. You could, so you, but it's better. The banks are still the best partner because they're the cheapest interest. Yeah. Stay away from hard money loans if you can. You know what those are? Those are like those loans that are like 14, 18 percent. They're like, you know, like loan sharks a little bit. But stay away from those if you can. It's, it's a part you can't. It's hard to make up that spread. It's just such a high spread. But I, I have a lot of people who want to offer me money to invest, and I always get them afraid to use that money because, like, I can get it from a bank. And well, if I'm done, I pay them off, and it's done. But versus, like, I'm not really sure. Once they give me the money, what control do they want? Yeah. Uh, it's like they can, uh, well, they, if they give you the money and you're in an LLC with them, then you do have to respect their their interest in that LLC. And you have to report to them, and you have to give them financial records, and you have to. Yeah, you do have to come up give them. But they could do a loan with them if they want to be as competitive as the bank. You could say, hey, the bank will give me money for 4%. You know, I'll borrow from you for 3.75. Mm -hmm. You could do that. You know, Remember like, that. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Any other? Is there any other questions online? Well, we can end early. There's, there's a lot of food in the back. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Party, one last thing. Here's it. Here's one last thing. In rebuilding cities, okay, in rebuilding our town, without the locals, without people like you, without like these people right here, cities will continue. The, the, the wealth will continue to spread from the rich to, to the poor. There'll be no middle class. And that's what we're talking about here is building middle class wealth back again and, and having, and, and cities will be much more uh, vibrant and creative when the locals own the real estate, when the locals own their real estate and businesses. So we're asking you to, to do this kind of work, to come do this kind of work with us because South Bend needs that. South Bend needs that to, 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 to move into the next century, move into our grandkids' um, you know, lives. Then I, I want to, like my grandkids, I'm always like, when they're going to ask me one day, well, what did you do about this when, I'm old, when yeah. they get older? What did you just make money, just build these like, crappy shopping centers, or did you really care about us? So that's what this is about. It's, it's about doing that and making money. With, if you don't make money, you can't do it again. You can only do it once. If you don't. Make money. You got to make money to be able to keep doing it, keep rolling. So, and thanks, Marty and Alkina, for uh, having us today. Appreciate it. And South Bend, and Tim Fortner. Yeah. And Tim Fortner over here. Uh, we got some really good people who care about their city a lot. Thank you, Tim. And our councilwoman is here tonight. Yes, okay. <laughs> We always invite outside people to come tell us what to do, but we don't need to do that anymore because we have inside people who can tell us what to do. So, anyway, thank you.